so still Jason from Ezekiel and Zikandre. Uh Thanks for coming. So um, I just want to start out. I'm going to give a couple of slides, just introduction to what Ezekiel is and what it's good for. Um, and then Dante and Jason are going to do a, a demo uh, of, well, I'll, I'll show you one, one thing really quickly, and then they'll do a demo, a more involved demo of the kind of thing you can build. Um, and we have a bunch of the team here, so we're hoping to kind of end that on the early side and have some time to walk around. If you want to try it out, we can give you help because um, the best thing to do, I mean, the whole point of it is for it to be a tool that we can put in your hands that is, uh, lets you do some ZK. So we aim to be the easiest and fastest development loop in ZK. Um, we're focused, of course, on machine learning and AI. Um, one of the things that makes it a fast development loop is, right, one of the cheat codes of AI is that instead of programming something, you can just train a model to do it. You can show it an example or a lot of examples and have it do the work for you. And we'll see a demo of that in a minute. Um, and it turns it into a zero knowledge proof, which you can verify on chain or in other load resource environments, um, Wasm or on a phone. Um, it's open source. We do have a service um, pictured here that lets you, uh, takes, makes it even simpler. Um, but you know, for most people, the entry point is this, a Google, a Google Colab notebook, and I encourage you to check that out. Um, I'll have a link at the end to one you can start with. Um, and so the idea is that you're gonna specify the logic of your app in Python, um, particularly an AI model or a statistic, statistical model, although there's increasingly general things we can do. And then uh, that Python is just ordinary. Um, then we used uh, Rust and Halo 2 to turn it into a zero knowledge prover and verifier. And you can deploy a Solidity verifier um, there's TypeScript and JavaScript uh, SDKs for the front end. And again, everything is open source. And now, as of yesterday, we have GPU acceleration, which also works in the Google Colab notebook, which is super fun. So that means you can use someone else's GPU if you, like us, are GPU poor. Uh, and, you know, someone else will pay for it. Um, it's also just really handy because it lets you just jump right in. Um, we iterate a lot with the folks who, who use this system. Some of you are here today. Um, and one of the things that we found over time is it's nice to have good defaults. We have a lot of kind of automated defaults, um, automated calibration to help you choose ZK parameters, like how many rows or how many columns to use. Um, and that is aimed at making your life easier, but you still have access to all of the detailed settings. So you can go in and you can change it to whatever you like. You can even go and dig into the Rust code and make you know, really hardcore changes if you want. Um, so that we aim to give you kind of clean, sensible defaults, as easy as possible to get started, and then you can uh, dig as deep as you like. Um, so you can set up from Python, you can prove, you can create a verifier, uh, deploy it, um, and verify on the EVM. This is what it looks like to write code that will be turned into a proof. This is just ordinary. PyTorch, um, it also works with TensorFlow and with scikit-learn. This is a gradient boosted tree uh, in scikit-learn. And you can prove and verify in a mobile browser. Um, Casey, who's here, will talk tomorrow about integrating with ZooPass PCD Pass, if you use that to get into other things at DevConnect. Um, and it's still pretty fast in the browser, although you have to have very realistic expectations about what you can do in the browser because there are serious limitations on memory. Um, and one of the more crazy things we also enable is that you can use your EVM verifier to verify in the browser, um, which is slower, but not you know, that much slower. Um, and then you have a single source of truth for whether the model works or not. So people often ask which models work. Um, lots of them do. Neural networks and vision models, um, convolutional neural networks, variety of decision trees, random forest, uh, transformers and small LLMs, um, things like NanoGPT. Uh, in theory, they could even be big LLMs, but you have to be very patient. Um, we have an ability to take a proof and split it up into many different pieces, prove them separately, and then combine them. Um, so it's really just a matter of doing the engineering work. If you wanted to get something like Llama to prove, um, that should be possible. We might do it, but it would be even happier if, if one of you did that. Um, well, not just because we're lazy, but also, <laughs> also because it shows how usable it is, right? So um, anyway, so uh, also classic statistics, data science, aggregation, business intelligence, analytics kind of stuff, regression, um, which you know, runs the world. 
and um, general purpose logic is increasingly possible, right? So the set membership example uh, is one that Casey will talk about uh, tomorrow. And that in ZooPass, people have used it for proof of solvency, all kinds of other things. So trying to make something that is useful for lots of things. So here's your first Colab notebook. This is just a really simple demo um, that has GPU enabled. Um, and to enable GPU, you write, instead of import uh, or pip install Ezekiel, you write pip install Ezekiel-GPU. So hopefully we'll eventually have that fixed and you can just use one thing, but for now you have to write dash GPU. Um, uh, okay. Uh, NVIDIA, yeah, yeah. Um, mainly just NVIDIA right now. We're using I Icicle from Inganyama. Um, that we collaborated with them on on uh, getting this integrated. Uh, so this is an example of the back end. If you want to make things really simple, um, you uploaded here. I uploaded a, uh, a convolutional neural network. Um, I can ask it to get a proof. Uh, I have to give it an input um, and ask it to get a proof, and then it's working on the proof and in a, about a second, it'll be ready. If you run this proof on a lot, this is like an MNIST size thing. If you run this on your laptop, it should probably take less than half a second, but there's some networking stuff that's going on here. Um, you can check out the model graph if you wanna see you know, what it was that you're proving. This is a small convolutional network. Um, and you can see the settings that are underlying it that let you, um, that you uploaded. Um, Okay, and you can download the Solidity Verifier, which you can then go deploy uh, on your own. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and go to a more interesting demo. All right, disgusting diagram. Um, cool, so something that uh, Jason sort of gestured at, I think, uh, is that basically once, you're, once you've built like a general purpose compiler that can you know, take an arbitrarily large neural network and compile it to a ZK circuit, uh, you can actually basically compile any arbitrary computational graph and you can start to think of like ZKML libraries as actually just like general purpose uh, ZK compute libraries. And as sort of a way to illustrate this, uh, JCM built a, a demo which basically serves where the neural network starts to serve as like a game engine for a tic-tac-toe. And the way we do that is we take a bunch of like tic-tac-toe telemetry data, like a bunch of tic-tac-toe states, feed it into a neural network and get it to recognize valid from invalid states. So if you wanted to play tic-tac-toe on chain, all you need to do is produce a tic-tac-toe state, feed it into the ZK circuit equivalent of the neural network and produce a proof that the game that you just produced is valid. You take the associated proof and the state and you can submit it on chain. You can maybe mint an NFT based on that or you know, win some sort of reward. And it's just a really simple way if you don't want to like code a lot of complicated, uh, basically dynamics or like game rules, for, for example, on chain, this is a really simple way to bootstrap that. And it's just a fun example of that. Yeah, so there were two flows that I think we probably don't have time to go in greater detail. So one of the model was using like a simple classification, the other was anomaly detection. So you'll get the notebooks up. So uh, it's just different ways of classifying good and bad games. So let me get to like the example. Is it linked already in the Telegram? It could be the penultimate has a Telegram. Yeah, so there's no... AI, uh, uh, you're not going to play for AI, so the purpose of this AI model here is just to classify whether the game is bad or not. So we're just more concerned about correct gameplay than whether someone, uh, whether someone won or not. So that could be handled on chain. So once you submit like the game, it goes to the proving server and it will give you, uh, you've got to wait for a while, and once the proof is back, it will give you like a message that allows you to make this. Uh, a MetaMask call. So, so if I click on this, it will basically mint me an NFT. So you can imagine the kind of applications that are possible in this framework. So maybe you might want to do, like if you want a tic-tac-toe game, maybe someone like 
like clear or gets some reward clear x like loses something. So you can do this in a verifiable way. So this is just a simple example. Uh, but we do it in a more general way, we, instead of creating a specialized ZK circuit, uh, we train on telemetry data. So in principle, this thing could, could scale to any kind of game. So you don't need to write a specialized ZK circuit, so you can write a game in like Unity, Godot, or like conventional engines, and collect those telemetry data, train on those, and you could also generate a ZK circuit for that particular game itself. So it, it so the goal is to it make the dev X, like the dev developer experience, much easier for making games like this. Uh, so this is just a simple demo, and we hope to go more with it. Uh, oh yeah, I guess I can run through the notebook really quickly. So, um, yes. Oh, okay, oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, let me make it. Or you could go to our domain, ezkl.xyz, and there's also the groups over there. Yeah, so this is one model. The other model was the classification one. So, yeah, I can either go through one notebook. Uh, so, maybe I'll go through the... Okay, sure, let's do classification then. So, so I, I guess classification is easier, easier to understand. So in this case, so, so we can properly take that to a game state. So they look like this. Uh, is it too small? Can we, let, let. Is this good enough for everyone? Okay, so, so in order to train on something like tic tac toe, we want to encode uh, the game history or like record the game history in a way that we can train over. So tic tac toe is interesting because the state space is really small and can use like a tree search to populate like all the possible moves. And so we populate all the possible moves with tree search, and to get the bad games, you just simply permute the moves. So this is just a simple permutation, uh, ring permutation operation. I'm not doing anything fa fancy here. So here's the model. So we get a tic-tac-toe net, which essentially takes in the game history and classifies yes or no whether the game is a good game or a bad game. So this is a really simple model. It's not anything fancy. It's just like linear, linear, redo, and, uh, and, and your output to one of either of two of the nodes. And once that is done, you can essentially load the data set. And this is where the annoying bit comes, and if you're done with this annoying bit, you can essentially run this training step, where you simply try to let the neural net classify between good and bad games. Okay. So in this case, we can get 100% accuracy because the state space is actually quite small. And once you are done, you simply need to export this onyx graph and run like the is equal steps where you gen generate the settings, generate the setup and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I think what's kind of cool about this, you can see that we're pretty far down inside the example. And so most of like the code that you're gonna be writing is basically just like regular data science logic. And then it's basically just like boilerplate to create circuits effectively. And we handle most of like, uh, I guess what you would call like the circuit hyperparameter selection for you. Yep. Ah, uh, no, it's, to, it's literally just to act as an arbiter over tic-tac-toe games. Was the game played correctly? Or incorrectly. So you could do this with chess, for example, and get it to determine whether, like, a pawn moved four squares too far, for example, relative to what it's allowed. Um, and so this is a really simple way to code that up without ever needing to, like, if you wanted to do it on chain, you never have to touch solidity or. Cairo or whatever. <laughs> so basically, 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. No, definitely not. Like, well, you could also produce a proof that it's 100% accurate. Because you can do inference, uh, let's say the test, there's some test data set for tic-tac-toe that is publicly available. You can produce a proof that it achieves 100% accuracy on that test data set, for example. That's definitely something that you could do when you publish the game at first. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the reason why I, are we, we are more interested in, in, for my case, I'm more interested in classifying fraudulent gameplays that is kind of similar to fraud proofs, like for optimistic rollups. So, so, but it's typically discrete kind of elements where you're dealing on the smart contract. But sometimes you might not want discretized like outcomes like yes or no, maybe it might be a 0 0.7 yes or 0 0.5 no. And neural networks allow you to encode this kind of uh, expressions on, on a smart contract. So you can essentially have more interesting uh, conditionals on a smart contract that does something, let's see something is fraudulent or not. And so that's why something like, uh, like uh, I guess a regression model, or in this case, a classification model to identify fraudulent states would be interesting. Uh, yeah, so I guess like the game context is mainly illustrative, uh, just like a fun way to present a tutorial. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, like we're pretty far down here in the example. So like most of what you're going to be writing, as I was saying, is like yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think. <laughs> All right, I'm out of the electromagnetic field. Um, yeah, so I guess what's interesting is that like you can really focus on like the data science logic of building an application as opposed to like writing ZK. But if you want to go in depth, we also offer options for that. Um, so basically, okay, what's sort of happening here? Um, I guess the bulk of what you might be interested in is in uh, generate settings. So when you call this command, you actually have a lot more options than what are shown here. You can actually we sort of like allow you to pick the visibility and play around with like the privacy of certain parts of the network. So for example, if you wanted to prove a statement like I ran a publicly known neural network on some private data that I have, that is possible within generate settings. If you wanted to write something like I have some public data and I have a private neural network that I ran on this data, that's also configurable within gen settings. And that sort of determines like the general visibility of different parts of the neural network when it gets compiled to a circuit. Is that clear? Cool. Um, generally, one of the more annoying parts about designing a circuit is, for example, if you're in, in something like Halo 2, which is what we use in the back end, you have to pick the number of rows. You have to pick the size of your lookup tables, like the, the different ranges that you might want to accommodate inside a lookup table. And what we ended up doing is creating a command that sort of like heuristically picks the best possible values for all of those sort of like circuit hyperparameters for you. So you don't have to think about it. So the way this works typically is um, because so the way we represent nonlinear functions for a neural network is by way of a lookup table. So for example, the sigmoid function is gonna have its own lookup. Um, you can't possibly know like the full range of values that it might see, but you can sort of like heuristically determine it if you pass it like a bunch of data and you sort of get mins and maxes that each of those lookup tables sees, right? And this helps you pick the exact lookup table sizes. Uh, that would accommodate all the calibration data that you feed it, plus like a little safety epsilon so that you don't get caught off guard. Um, it also picks like the optimal set, optimal number of log rows um, for you. Is that clear? Cool. Um, next command, really simple. We have a bunch of like SRS because we use the KZG version of Halo 2. Uh, it just picks it, it just downloads it from an S3 bucket for you. Uh, it then takes all of these settings and then sort of like hardens them 
into a serialized format for you, which is just like the compiled circuit format. And then you can get into the guts of proving, basically. Uh, you can set everything up, so generate your verifier and proving key, uh, given like a SRS. Uh, you can generate your witness, and then you can prove over it. <laughs> so actually the notebook is even shorter. <laughs> yeah, if, you're, if you don't want to waste time proving in full, you can just mock proof and check that all of your constraints uh, are satisfied before you generate a full proof. Um, and then you can verify it all within the same notebook. Um, you can also create, it's not shown here, but you can create a, a solidity verifier uh, that also performs this operation on chain if you want to, and you can also deploy it from the same notebook, essentially. We can go over another non-game example as well. There's the Ezekiel demo as well, if you want to run through it. Um, just Ezekiel underscore demo is the other one. No. No, but open it in Colab. While we're waiting, does anyone have questions? On the notebook, yes. What do you mean? Yeah. Definitely possible. And we have some example example notebooks that use convolution as well, if you want to try it out. I think at this point, like most most networks that you can dream up or think of compile to a circuit, basically. Oh, no, it starts with an E. Yeah, there it is, nice. All right, sweet. I guess it's a it's a slightly more serious application. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but I guess in this case, like for for uh, the Ivy data, I can also classify it as a data. So previously in the tic-tac-toe, we are more or less classifying game telemetry data, but I would imagine that if you're trying to do a DeFi application, you might not need telemetry data. So, so you might be looking at things like this, where you have some kind of table and some kind of values and some kind of target. So you can also run on things like this using a neural network. Um, oh, right. There's also one other... Uh, example, which I guess might be interesting. Uh, so I also did one using this uh, neural network called NBeats. So it does time series forecasting. So maybe you might want to have like a rebalancing algorithm on chain. So that could be used. Uh, should I also show like the NBeats? So but yeah, I guess maybe like, a, uh, like the key gist is that a lot of like the research in AI and and just like time series forecasting and also computer vision can also be applied to the smart contracts and, and in the context of cryptography. So you kind of get the best of both worlds with something like Ezekiel. Um, let me get a notebook. Yeah, so, yeah, so NBeats is kind of a paper by, I think, is it, I think by Joshua Bengio, who, so, so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a time series forecasting model for interpretable time series forecasting. So, it, so in, this, in this notebook, we are simply predicting like the price or ETH. So you can actually 
So, so this this model is still kind of janky. It's not fine tuned. I, I have like a better model that I use, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. But you can essentially run things like time series forecasting on Eve, and it actually gets quite decent re results. So, uh, oh wait. So I need to. Yeah, I need to create the file. I have to uncomment this one. Yep, so in this case, we can calculate like returns and see what's the average return for E per day. Oh, it's actually quite good. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I was actually using this as part of a, of a, a portfolio rebalancing algorithm and it just says uh, like 100% in E max bin. <laughs> so so uh, maybe the AI was right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you can run like data science models on this and just get a sense of what you're actually dealing with. So right here, I'm essentially tr just like modeling like the standard deviation, like the, the covariant matrix. So you can also run um, and, and just check like the correlations. So I have like a longer one to see what the price, the assets correlated with. And you can plot like the history. And once that is done, you can also run like other experiments like simulating like the portfolio growth and you can like plot it out. And once that is done, you can essentially run the, the data processing step. So I, I think like most of the issues in, in just data science in general, it's not like the models, but trying to fit stuff into the models. So, so that's like the tricky bit. And uh, I'm not sure whether I should go through, go through in detail about this. So it's its own, like just this thing is its own talk, but uh, yeah, but you can look into this paper called And Beats. So uh, it's 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 quite an influential paper in time series forecasting. And sorry, yeah. I guess what's what's pretty cool is that if you scroll up, this is like a pretty complex model that we're able to compile. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite complex. So yeah, so the the compiler is basically able to handle some like pretty complex like graphical structures, uh, almost anything that you can throw at it. Um, so if you have some crazy idea, so we even have graphical neural networks in there, uh, some like recommendation system type things uh, that also compile that may be like slightly more complex than just like a regular feed forward network, which is pretty cool. Um, and if you guys have ideas for any crazy architectures right now, speak up. thing about like just is equals that uh, uh, the time for to to a uh, to a research level like neural net to I guess in production is not that far off. So if someone publishes something in like like AI literature that might be interesting for maybe for on chain applications or even for zk applications, you can essentially just port it over almost quite quickly. So so you can also use things like uh, like. Uh, PyTorch lightning or, or weights and biases. So, so we are not opening it on the, on the back ends they used to train. So I tried this on PyTorch lightning and it also works. Uh, so yeah, it, it's quite a flexible tool. Yeah, I guess to that point as well, like a lot of models that tend to outperform on like medium to small amounts of data, particularly tabular data. So for example, XGBoost or Random Forest are also supported. So if you like running things with XGBoost or sklearn or something, which has like a bunch of good defaults and is super easy to train uh, for like most applications, um, then we also support that. And that probably covers like most of data science, to be honest, is like XGBoost sort of models. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, well, they are using us as the thing in production and it's deployed. So the credit scoring stuff and the portfolio rebalancing stuff, some of it is live as well. Oh, I mean, uh, outside of the production. I guess we have to take that to an AI live. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to pull up Crypto <laughs> Idol? Yeah, nice. Yeah. I guess, so, so I guess the thing is pretty safe. Uh, yeah, you want me to do like a new part of Wi-Fi instead? Like the wi is great. It's yeah, it's a cool. giant asset. <laughs> 
I guess, okay, so in terms of other application spaces, so we just came from the Autonomous Worlds Conference and folks are, and so we sort of hinted at this, um, and there's sort of like a thriving community there that is building like pretty interesting experiences on chain. Um, what's interesting about ZKML, and I hinted at this at the beginning, is that it's not really restricted to like neural networks as graphs. Um, and you can represent some pretty interesting stuff. So for example, let's say you want to build like on-chain physics and you have a weather model for a world which is governed by some smart contract. You can encode that pretty simply as you know, a graph in, a, in, a, in PyTorch basically. And that's sort of what we've seen in that domain. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes, we have a demo coming. It's a little bit of a weird one. Um, should we talk about the worm? All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So there's a there's a demo coming basically where a, a bunch of folks from Harvard and MIT created a generative model to basically simulate the connectome of a C. elegans worm. So it takes in like a bunch of olfactory data and dirt <laughs> sensory information and then produces a voltage activation map. And it's just a simple VAE. And so we ended up ZKing this generative model and then you can basically post a proof of worm on chain and it's like a reusable sort of MPC that other folks can plug into. Uh, and <laughs> yes, it's on the repo. Yeah, it's in a branch separately. But yeah, no. Uh, but we're currently building the interface so you can visualize the worm. Yeah. They upload the lobsters to the internet and they become sentient. No? <laughs> this is Accelerando, but for worms. <laughs> yeah. There's no there's no connectome for lobsters yet. Yep. What? Yeah, I'll I'm gonna <laughs> I'm switching to biology. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so great question. Like how does it scale basically based on neural network size, um, quasi-linearly basically. Um, it, it, there's some nuance. Part of the, so part of what's happening here is that we take a graph and then we're compiling it to a bunch of arguments inside a circuit. Um, so depending on how we've designed those arguments, uh, you know, certain operations may induce more constraints or less constraints in the circuit. So it's not a perfect relationship. So for example, um, for example, like transformer models use an operation uh, over tensors called gather, which is effectively like you have to index over a tensor and then mask it out effectively, which is kind of complex in ZK, although we've implemented it. Um, but something that would be trivial uh, in non-ZK land, which is just literally indexing over a tensor, gets a little bit more dicey in ZK and induces more constraints effectively. Does that make sense? But if you're interested in particular benchmarks, um, so our CI pipeline is public and it runs all the time and there's benchmarks uh, for almost every single model in the examples folder um, if you're intrigued. Yeah. Cool. 
And it, yeah, and there's also like a benchmarks uh, pipeline, yeah, for lots of different things. So if you're interested in like keeping up to date with how long different models take, uh, you can see some results here. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're currently writing a piece on this uh, inbound, uh, and we're much faster than a lot of the VM-based approaches. Uh, someone actually took, uh, actually, as a, as a hackathon project, uh, took Ezekiel, compiled it into an instruction set, and then built like a, a sort of like ZK VM for ML specifically. Um, and it's much, much slower, like 40 times slower when you take a VM-based approach. Um, yeah, uh, concrete, concrete is, concrete is mostly FHE, right? Yeah. So it's a bit of a different beast, right? It's a different sort of application space. I'm actually a little bit less, the last time I tried concrete, I think was like August of last year. So I'm a little bit, yeah, I'm a little bit unfamiliar as to how fast it is now. So I cannot speak to that, but it, very cool and a, sort of like a different application space. Um, but a little bit unclear as to like what the latest and greatest FHG stuff is. Yep. Yep. Oh, great question. Um, so originally one of our, I guess as of a few weeks ago, one of the bottlenecks was for extremely large circuits, right? Like memory consumption was just sort of staggering. Um, we recently rolled out the ability to take an extremely, yeah, I guess you're familiar with it, or. Okay, okay, I guess it's a similar concept, uh, or maybe not, but. Um, oh. Okay, cool. Yeah, that would be really cool. So we implemented the ability to take a large circuit and then start to partition it into larger, into smaller subgroups, uh, which aren't as memory uh, intensive, you can either run those proofs sequentially so that like your maximum sort of like memory envelope, you know, for usage uh, is sort of capped throughout proving, or the really crazy thing you can do is take those proofs, those smaller sub proofs, and then send them each to like an individual GPU, prove in parallel, and then, yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess lookups are still a little bit slow. Great to accelerate those. Um, we use a different lookup argument than Halo 2 does originally. Um, sort of exploring, maybe using CQ, but the problem is like the size of the artifacts that you then generate, right? Um, so yeah, probably lookups at the moment. Uh, we're also looking for like more efficient ways to do like a dot product argument in particular. Um, but we've made some pretty massive strides over the past week uh, in improving that. Um, but yeah, what's kind of interesting is that you can basically represent a lot of linear operations as uh, Einstein summation. You may be familiar with this. Um, so we basically have like two arguments. The, a graph basically gets compiled into two arguments. There's like all the linear operations get represented as Einstein summation, and all the nonlinear operations get represented as lookups. Uh, so when we're looking for performance improvements at the argument level, we're going to be targeting one of those two things, effectively. Uh, yeah, I think you're referring specifically to like, uh, like a, a prover that is very good at matrix multiplication, for example. Uh, yeah, so something like GKR would be naturally suited for this. Um, and I think there's, I think increasingly people are becoming, just from like an engineering perspective, or becoming slightly more brave with like, <laughs> you know, stitching together lots of provers. Um, so there's definitely the possibility of like dedicating like the proving part uh, for matrix multiplication to something like GKR uh, to then like accelerate matrix multiplication. But it, but for us, even for the dot product, like GKR would be 
pretty useful, basically. Um, yeah, and we're looking into that. Yeah, I have a GKR implementation floating around if you want to check it out. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Actually, they, I think they're building a GKR based prover for matrix multiplication. They, they now have GKR in the long cache repo. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and it, yeah, super nice. And those sorts of efforts are gonna make stitching these things together a lot easier, for sure. All right, any other outstanding questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for, for Rust verification. Yeah, we have a CLI. Uh, we have a CLI, you can, it's written in Rust, you can just verify things from the CLI. The library is also exportable, so if you want to import, I'm assuming, what is the intended sort of like, <laughs> use case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can just pull in the, I mean, the, yeah, you can just pull in Halo 2 verifier functions. There's a lot of boilerplate that you can just pull in. Um, we also have a WASM verifier for Keen. <laughs> uh, if you want to verify in browser. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. I, you're assuming which parts are are not done on GPU. Oh, gotcha. So some some operations uh, that happen during proving. So for example, MSMs or uh, some FFTs. Although we haven't implemented FFTs in the GPU, are pretty parallelizable. Parallelizable. <laughs> um, so you can start to like send some of those operations to the GPU. Not the entire proving process, but like those sorts of. At the proving level. Right, it's Yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but, that, but you're sort of like doing a forward pass in some sense, um, just proving over it, basically. And, and most of the overhead right now is in proving, not in the forward pass, basically. So like getting those numbers down is kind of critical. Yes. I think so. I think what you're referring to is specifically like adversarial examples for neural networks. Um, like this isn't immune to that, I, except if you keep like certain parts of it private. But the fact that you can like, say for example, it's hosted as a public API, the fact that you can like query the, potentially send an input and query an output means that you can recreate sort of like a, a simulacra of the model that might be running uh, remotely. It won't be like a perfect uh, thing, but it may emulate it quite well. But you won't be able to generate fake proofs. Um, because it needs to match exactly one to one with the uh, original, um, and given the like stochastic nature of training, uh, the like if you don't know the model, well, let's say you know the model architecture, given the like stochasticity of training, the likelihood of that happening is like pretty small. <laughs> um, but I think another point, another interesting point that you bring up is that there are, like for example, in tic tac toe. Uh, if the if the input space wasn't like so small, you could imagine that like if the input input space is sufficiently large for a game, you can always find like some invalid state that sort of like breaks the model effectively, um, and that's like a common problem in machine learning. There's like some research on it to like help mitigate that. You can use like common regularization methods like L2 regularization during training, and that can help 
mitigate that risk. But it's not perfect, for sure. Cool. All right. Any other questions? <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, that was super cool. Had some really good questions. Um, if you have any follow-up questions that pop into mind later on, uh, feel free to ask us in the Telegram. Um, if you want to help build the warm dirt world on chain, uh, please reach out. <laughs> um, yeah. And if there are any examples, uh, anything that you might want to build on top, if there's any example in the examples folder that you find particularly inspiring, but don't know how to like take that example and to turn it into your idea, uh, you can also reach out and we can help with the, I guess just like the data science bit, perhaps if you're unfamiliar with that. 